Hello, and welcome to the Rules of the Game podcast, where it is my job to discuss democratic institutions. Democracy needs to be defended. Democracy needs to be defended not only against autocrats and authoritarian forces, but also against so-called anti-democrats that think the political and intellectual elites know better and should decide in lieu of the rest of the society. Democracy needs to be defended against those who want to restrict the right to participate and the right to decide. With Rosalind Fuller, I discuss how democracies are under threat. Direct democracy offers a powerful option to give people more decision-making power and hence more control of the political process. But it has to be applied and used with caution and we seek to correct some of the misunderstandings around this powerful political tool. Roslyn also shares her experiences with citizen assemblies that are currently organized all over and explains why she does not support them as a tool to strengthen democracy. Finally, we also discuss the risks and opportunities of digital technologies for democratic institutions. Dr. Roslyn Fuller has written several books on democracy, the latest titled In Defense of Democracy. She was educated in Germany and Ireland with a PhD in international law from Trinity College in Dublin. Roslyn's experience as a lecturer, author and political consultant has given her unique insights into structures of public governance and, above all, the mechanics of political power. Her relentless defense of people power has seen her articles and interviews published in countless newspapers and magazines. And I link to her website in the show notes where you find all her research and contributions. I am your host, Stefan Kaiwertz, and this is the 13th episode of the Rules of the Game podcast. I am a political economist with a PhD in economics from the University of Bern in Switzerland. And I previously held positions at the London School of Economics and Political Science and the Center for Global Development. You find a full transcript of the conversation on my website, rulesofthegame.blog. If you enjoy this episode, please leave a review on your preferred podcast platform and share it with friends and colleagues. Now, please enjoy this wide-ranging conversation with Roslyn Fuller. Roslyn Fuller, welcome to the Rules of the Game podcast. I'm very happy to have you on the show. Yeah, well, thanks for inviting me. So as usual, I start with the question that I ask all my guests on the podcast. What is your first memory of democracy? Yeah, I think my first memories of democracy aren't um, really that high flown. I'm from a rural area in Canada. And I guess the things I really would associate with that would be kind of the everyday things of life. So, for example, we would bank at a credit union, um, which is where members make the decisions. We, I worked at a cooperative company, which was founded in the Great Depression. And our religion was kind of like a kind of Quaker religion. So we didn't really have any priests or anything. We had this kind of religion where we just went to a meeting house and people talked for the most part. So it was this really kind of open discussion. And that's how so many institutions in my everyday life were constituted that when I think about democracy, I think of those things of people like just kind of making the decisions that are important for their lives. And I think that's kind of a difference between how I think of it and a lot of other people who are in political science, um, because we hear a lot of things about, you know, democracy should be inclusive and it should be fun. Um, it doesn't seem like a lot of fun to go down to the credit union um, or not to mention to go to like essentially to go to church or to mediate or whatever. Um, but these are things that kind of had to be done. And there were things where like the members would make those decisions for themselves and have a level of self-determination in their lives. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is that um, half of my family uh, immigrated from Spain to Argentina and then to Canada. So 
I guess because of that, I had a more developed sense of dictatorship than, than a lot of people in Canada would um, and kind of had this understanding of that as being like a very, very real thing um, and politics being a potentially very, very hard hitting business as well um, that you shouldn't get involved with it unless you were prepared to, to see things through all the way. Um, so I think those are two things that kind of affected me in my early life that are probably a little bit different than maybe some other people. So that is kind of a strong sense for, for a local democratic institution as well, right? As I understand you. Yeah, I mean, I myself actually favor national reforms. I think sometimes people get a little bit affected by uh, local, you know, this emphasis on the localness. But at the same time, at the time in my life, I grew up in this rural area. It was before the internet. I mean, national politics were something that happened very far away from our little town. So we would... We, you know, watch the news, we knew what was going on, but we didn't expect to partake in those things necessarily ourselves. And so your kind of family story through Spain, Argentina, and then Canada, did that affect like your, your sense of, okay, there can be, there can go stuff really wrong with democracy and, and we need to defend it, which also maybe led to you to, to write like several books on, on democracy and the latest one in defense of democracy, in which you really defend the, the principle of democracy itself. Like at what point did you kind of realize that you need to fight and defend democracy? Yeah, I think they definitely, that definitely did have an impact on me because for my grandparents and for my mother, um, these events were just events that happened to them in their lives, you know, like they're not, it's not like people put out an official announcement, you know, like one thing leads to another, leads to another. Um, and I think that a lot of the time people in Western countries are quite complacent about their democracy, far more so than they should be, you know. Um, and they think also of like democracy is everything that's good and dictatorship is everything that's bad. Um, my family really fled the dictatorship in Spain. Um, they had a really hard time under it. But at the same time, they sometimes had good things to say about it. You know, there wasn't, they'd sometimes say like, well, there wasn't any crime and, you know, things, things like that. So it kind of think I had a more differentiated view and an understanding that even people who left, I mean, they left and they never wanted to go back, that even they would say, well, you know, there were a few okay points. And, and there are things that it's not a matter of saying, okay, that's evil. That must be anti-democratic. This is good. This must be democratic. It's all pros and cons. And there can be very seductive reasons for people to choose a society that's not democratic, you know? Um, so I think that's definitely an impression I had. I felt that I really need to start defending democracy and not just talking about it, but defending the concept of democracy, that we should live in democracies after 2016 with the Brexit vote and the Trump election of Trump. Not because I felt like, oh, those things are terrible and they make us live not in a democracy, but because of the number of people who came out at that time and published wave after wave after wave of articles and books saying, OK, if this is how people are going to vote, then there shouldn't be democracy. There's too much democracy. You know, the elites need to rise up against the masses. We need to stop this somehow. And there was just this, this incredible wave of this. I almost felt like I'm the only person left who thinks it should be democracy. And uh, some things they were saying were also quite off the ball as well. You know, um, just these kind of really strung together stories and statistics. So I kind of wanted to disprove some of that. And that's why I wrote my book. So the question about too much democracy, I think, is, is a really central one. And also, we hear it again and again, also among political scientists, right, who say, uh, you know, if people have to make too many, too many decisions or, I don't know, maybe they can't make good decisions when they have like a referendum, etc. And in your book, you, you go to some length to defend how people make decisions. Obviously, we know that nobody makes always uh, rational and perfect decisions, but neither do the elites, right? So how do you really answer the question is, is there too much democracy? Yeah, I, I don't think there can be too much democracy, as you may have guessed. Um, I think that people sometimes under, misunderstand the word democracy. It comes from Greek and it means people power. It doesn't mean like people work. So you actually don't need to be involved in every aspect of a decision all of the time. And this is kind of like the Swiss model. 
But like, like the CEO of a company, you have the power to look at something if it's not going okay. So you might not 24 hours a day in your life be completely up on every last building regulation or every environmental regulation, but if there's an issue, you have the right to zero in on that and to deal with that issue. That's kind of the place of a people in a democracy to be that kind of, I think in a way, CEO on top of it that says, okay, I'm not involved. I'm not every one of my 100,000 workers in this company, but I can always, if there's a problem in the accountancy department, or if there's a problem in the sales department, I can always just zero in on that and fix that. I have the power to do that. So I think that's important. And I think that's why some people say democracy can't work because they think it means everyone has to do everything all of the time together. That's not the case. It's mainly troubleshooting and preventing problems. Um, so that's one thing. As to your point, can people make good decisions? Yes. I mean, as you say, no decision is perfect. Every decision has pros and cons. Every decision is a matter of interests. It often depends what your interests are. So an example that I went into in my book and is often used is this example of Proposition 13 in the United States and California. And this was back in the 70s. Uh, property prices in California were skyrocketing. And this uh, referendum came up called Proposition 13 that wanted to limit property tax hikes. Because property tax is quite expensive in the United States compared to like, most places in Europe. So the reason this was an issue is because a lot of retired people were having trouble paying their bills and staying in their homes. But, and California was running a surplus at the time. But later on, because the property tax fell away, uh, California got into some budget issues. And I mean, that wasn't the only factor of those budgetary issues either. It was a lot of other issues as well. But people like use this as this kind of like stellar example of why people should never decide anything. Well, we all live in time in a way. This is like the fourth dimension. You can't just make a decision about property tax and say, well, that's it. You know, now everything else stays the same. We can't make any adjustments. We can't say, all right, cool. We're not going to boot these elderly retired people out of their homes because their property tax has gone sky high and their income hasn't changed. We're going to maybe rebalance the tax load, right? If it's not coming from property tax, maybe it has to come from something else or maybe expenses have to be cut back. So this kind of way of like kind of sort of cherry picking these things and sort of not allowing things to take their natural course leads to a lot of difficulties, I think, in this kind of perception of, oh, it was a bad decision, you know, in the end, sure, like 50 years later, after, after, after a lot of other developments have occurred, and no one has done anything to correct it. So that's also an issue is that I think of democracy as well as being a lot of little adjustments, you know, and when you write a law, I'm coming from a legal background, criminals don't just sit there and go, oh, well, they made a law, I guess that's it then. You know, they think of a way around it. So you have to make another law. And then they think a way around that one. And you make another law, right? So that's life. It's, it's always just making laws and closing loopholes and moving on. Yeah, exactly. And I also... What we often forget is that if we have direct democratic decisions, for example, right, then if you just ask the people once for some question, but not for another question, then how should they make the system work, right? Like the, the Brexit example is actually um, quite quite telling because the people were asked once about Brexit just like in a very general way, right? But then there wasn't a second decision on how, what actually the people wanted or how they would like to implement it, right? So as I also write in, in one of my blog posts about principles of direct democracy is actually that direct democratic decisions should be reversible or should be adjustable. Like if the people think, oh, this first decision was not maybe quite right or was not specific enough, then they should be able to have another say. And obviously also what we saw during after the Brexit referendum that after a while it became clear that there's so many different solutions on the table or possibilities that a lot of people ask for a second referendum, which never happened, unfortunately. And I think it would have been great to have like a follow up, you know, decision. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I guess it also depends a lot on who is the initiator of these referendums. So um, in most countries, like in Ireland, for example, the government decides when we will have a referendum. We don't have citizen-initiated referendums. So those can also be used in kind of like the opposite way of Brexit, like quite opportunistically to try to get the votes they want on the European Union. Um, and we don't really have this kind of ongoing dialogue as you want. You know, you get a question on the referendum, you have to answer that. You don't 
you can't pick something, a third choice, right? Um, so this is also kind of an issue of manipulation. It's like sometimes when you have, um, you know, when the government is able to pick the time of the election as well. That's always an advantage. You know, that's also an advantage that you can use to, to your advantage. So those are all factors. And yeah, I mean, with the Brexit referendum, obviously, they thought they were going to win it. Um, the, uh, if you want, Remain side thought they were going to win it. Um, and they didn't really, I don't think they really took it seriously enough. You know, their entire campaign, they didn't take seriously enough. And they didn't take seriously enough trying to convince people of really why they should, you know, why they should choose Remain at all. They just kind of took it for granted. And that's obviously also a cardinal mistake when you're running a referendum is to take people's vote for granted and not go out there and ex try to explain why is it good for you? Why should you do this? So, yeah. Yeah, it was quite, quite a risky game by Cameron and, and they lost it. It didn't go their way. And what I write in that blog post is actually that referendum should be bottom up, not top down. So the people should decide when they want to decide on something and not, you know, like politicians deciding as an agenda setter when people are allowed to to decide on issues. But maybe that's also a, a, another another discussion. Yeah, I think even in that example, though, with Brexit, like there has been a certain amount of good has come out of it. Like there has been this really intense discussion about uh Britain's place on the world, like, first of all, the European Union, but also the world for like the last five years, really. And it's really gotten quite in depth and really opened up, I think, a lot of space to discuss a lot of different aspects of government in uh, in Britain, you know, in the direction of the country in general, which really weren't on the table before. So even in that example where, yes, there's a lot of things around it that aren't I, what you would want to see in ideally uh, in a referendum or a citizen-led democracy, it still led to a kind of um, revitalization, I think, of democracy in Britain, actually, in some ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the discussion definitely became <laughs> way more intense as it was before. And it's also, it was a fundamental uh, decision, even though the consequences, um, yeah, could be quite dire. And we will probably only be able to make a judgment in in, in a few years So in your book, you also say a lot about so-called anti-democrats. You call them anti-democrats, people who are not really in favor or don't want to give the people a, a lot of power because they think, for example, that the elite or educated people can can make better judgments on what is good for the people, right? <laughs> so who, who are these anti-democrats? And do you think this is like just a decentralized you know, some people are in favor of more democracy or less, or are there, is there, is this more strategic? Is there more organization behind um, this? What is your opinion on that? Yeah, pe people ask me that a lot. Um, I, I do think it's more just like a combination of interests. I think our societies have become much more stratified. So when I was a kid 40 years ago, um, most people were middle-class people and you didn't, see very wealthy people too often and for poor people there were social services but if you ran into someone they probably didn't have an income too much different than your families you know that's changed a lot so people now are very very stratified um you know whether or not you go to university now depends more and more on the family you came from um the kind of house you live in the kind of lifestyle you have um and i think those people have kind of created a kind of parallel world for themselves. Um, and that parallel world is now suddenly confronted with like the other half of the world, really, or more than the half, really, because in any society, more people are poor than are rich. So, so you're kind of suddenly confronted with people who are not happy about how society is going, for example. Uh, for example, maybe aren't happy about free trade, right? Um, or aren't happy about some of the European Union policies, right? These are all things that are sources of deep dissatisfaction. And when they're confronted with that, I think because it's so out of their like wheelhouse and their experience of life, they think, well, it's wrong. And I have a degree. And I, in fact, I have an advanced degree. So I must be right. I am more educated objectively. So therefore, I'm right. And your disagreement is caused by ignorance. It can't be caused by anything else. It must be caused by ignorance. And so, you know what? Maybe giving you a say in this wasn't a very good idea after all, right? So I think this is kind of what's happening is I think it's a consequence of the stratification 
of society where you have a kind of, I call them courtier sometimes, a kind of layer that sort of removed itself from everybody else and has benefited a lot, um, but not to the point where they can actually afford to ignore everybody else, but they think they can. And so a lot of the a lot of academics and journalists and politicians would fall into this category um, because I think that they are people who are also threatened by more participation because they kind of depend on having a certain status. You know, I'm an expert. What I say is is expert. What experts think, in a way, and and so I think it kind of threatens them to have more participation as well. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, it kind of questions also their their expertise in in some way. But still, people know much more about their own lives and what is good for their own, you know, life in the sense that they know their struggles, they know what's hard and what decisions actually would probably make their lives easier. That's that's kind of my opinion. So also the question of can there be too much democracy? Well, you have to ask the people what is too much democracy or how much one want they participate in a in a decision, right? So it's really hard to say what is too much democracy if you don't know whether people are happy with how the democracy is working. Yeah, I think exper like expertise is obviously very important in a democracy and experts actually have a really important role to play, but only to the extent that they're actually engaging with people, right? I mean, why is it important to you? And why are you, and are you willing to be grilled by another expert, right? Um, you can't just say, this is what I think. So this is what all experts think. Now shut up and, and obey it, right? You'd have to make a case for someone to try to understand like what's important for you. And yeah, why, why would you care what I'm saying? You know? And, and I think increasingly they've just been less and less willing to do that. You know, um, so there's kind of these little clicks in a way. And I notice this really in academia as well. There's these little clicks like we've all decided this. So that's the way it is. And I'm not going to explain myself to someone else. Like, that's weird. Why do you exist? <laughs> Why do we pay? <laughs> I mean, that's literally your job description is to go out there and explain your things to other people, you know? So, of course, you. I mean, some people might be mean to you or nasty to you. I mean, that's going to happen. But I think, you know, most people won't most of the time, you know. Yeah. So one way out that, especially in political science, has taken more uh, more room in the discussion are citizen assemblies. So uh -huh. for those who don't know, um, citizen assemblies are essentially a group of citizens that are uh, selected by sortition by a random lot. So people join a, a citizen assembly that might be, I don't know, maybe you probably know much more about them than I do. It could be 40, 60 or 100 people that join together for a day or several days and discuss on certain uh, topics and then make recon recommendations to the official government institutions. And that for political scientists is often a way to bring in more participation, more deliberation um, to to make democracy more democratic. Even though my 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 main concern is that actually, you know, they might even distract a bit from from the main democratic institutions that are still a long way off from being the optimum. You know, a lot of our official democratic institutions could be improved to make them more democratic, right? Especially also uh, direct democracy, obviously, would be one, one of the solutions. So what is your opinion on citizen assemblies or, or your experiences with, with them? Yeah, okay. So um, I was actually on the advisory board of a citizens assembly in Northern Ireland, and we've had citizens assemblies here in Ireland as well. So I've really had an up close uh, look at them over the years. Uh, I do not like them, at least as they're presently constituted, um, for a couple of reasons. Um, the first is that they've kind of taken an institution of Greek democracy, which was random selection and completely mangled it. Um, and that leaves us, unfortunately, with all kinds of issues when it comes to them. What you've kind of sort of touched on, which is the participation rate already, a hundred people sounds like a lot of people. It's like nobody. I mean, I think as I said in some article I wrote, like you go into the London tube, there's like 900 people on a tube. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I, I ran in an election here. You feel like you are talking, you know, like the Queen of England, right? Like as if you've shaken more hands than you ever wanted to shake. And yet you, there's still people you don't know, you know? There are so many people in the world that 100 is like not very many people. Sure, they may participate deeply, they may talk to each other, but you've left out 99.99% of people and you haven't allowed them to participate because 
they are selected, as you mentioned, kind of like with a jury service, right? You get a letter and, you know, your neighbor doesn't get it. So maybe you're selected and they're not. It is like winning a lottery ticket. Okay. But in our democracies, our understanding is not that we've won a lottery to be allowed to participate. We do have a right to participate. And this is, I think, where, where the fact that my, my family came from a dictatorship comes in, right? I feel like they didn't go to Canada for this, right? For yeah, a chance yeah. <laughs> to participate. We came here because we have rights. And that's, I think, a very, very fundamental difference. You know, democracy is about self-determination. It's about saying, I have a right as a citizen and a duty as a citizen, to participate in this dis discussion right now, right? Um, and to participate in decision making. So that's one issue that I think is a big issue. And because they're so small, they can't be accurately representative either. So their big claim is that they try to be more representative, but these are bodies so small that like, that's not possible, right? It's, it's too small to be accurate. Um, the other thing is that of course, uh, so a lot of the time politicians will just cherry pick the answers, the recommendations that you get. So before, maybe six or seven years ago now, we had a constitutional convention in Ireland. Um, and actually their job was to think about constitutional changes. Now, our constitution means we have to have a referendum. So their job was basically to just come up with, referen uh, with recommendations that would potentially be put to referendum later on. But of course, the government has put like, I don't know, maybe three of, of 40 recommendations ever to a vote. Like this was, you know, they picked the parts they wanted and especially some of their more interesting radical parts like housing, which is the biggest single issue we have in this country, housing, which is very expensive. Just like, who knows what happened to that, right? And it's eight years later. So these things aren't necessarily able, of course, they don't have any legitimacy, they don't have the backing of people, most people haven't participated. So how are you going to really move this up the agenda and get something done, even if it's a great idea that potentially would have everybody's backing. And this happened again with the French Assembly, you know, they were all going on about how great the French Citizens Assembly on Climate Change was, that was recently had. Okay, well, Emmanuel Macron is not an idiot. The guy worked at Goldman Sachs, and he's running a country when he's like my age. I mean, He's a smart person, okay? Like, he politicianed you, right? They, they had all these recommendations. One of them was to impose a tax to pay for all of these climate recommendations that they made, to impose a tax on wealthy or corporations. And that's the first thing he said, well, we're not going to do that. Like, within, mm. within hours, they said, we're not going to do that. <laughs> well, of course not. I mean, you know, uh, a politician politicianed you. Like, you made a system that made that possible. So, of course, that's what happened, right? So, this is an issue as well. And just the other thing, another thing, I won't go on forever, but another issue is this kind of question of legitimacy. So if you say, and this is a question of should these, uh, should these recommendations be binding or not be binding, right? So there's two schools of thought. One would say they should be binding, and another one should say they shouldn't be binding, and things should go on to be considered by the government or maybe a referendum, fine. Well, if they are binding, you've basically recreated communism, which is a system where some unaccountable small group of people is making decisions for you. It's completely depressing and there's no accountability, right? Uh, if you're not willing to have accountability for what you say, why should anyone else care? If you do make it non-binding, we also have that. It's called a focus group and governments do those all of the time. So you haven't told them anything they don't already know. You know, I think a common problem of citizens' assemblies is they think, well, if the politicians only knew what people wanted. As I said, I've run in an election. I've been canvassing. You get bored. You, within three days, you know everything. You know, like, I'm uh, don't be disrespectful, but you practically know the color of, people, of people's underwear, you know, after, after <laughs> three days. Like, there's nothing left, you know. So the idea that, that politicians are unaware and that they just need people to... To tell them, I think, is is a bit naive, frankly. I, I totally agree. And also, I think, you know, democracy is about power. It's really about who makes decisions, who is sitting in our, you know, official government institutions or in government. And when I first came across this 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 concept, because from a Swiss perspective, also it feels somewhere it's it's a bit you know, like, I don't know where to locate it, really, these citizen assemblies. And for me, it was always like, well, shouldn't our parliaments be citizen assemblies? You know, shouldn't, like, our parliaments be full of citizens <laughs> who make decisions, right, uh, on on behalf of, of, of the whole population? And also because, I guess, in, in, in Switzerland, we have the munici municipality assemblies, which only work because I think our municipalities are very small. 
So it's actually possible that all the citizens who want to join the assembly can join and 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 make decisions uh, for for the municipality. So for me, always seem like the citizen assembly doesn't. It's it's quite hard to to fit them in. And I don't say like they have no. I mean, there's probably some some possibilities where where they could be useful. But for me, they distract in some way from from the more important questions of how can we make our democracy is more democratic. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, the the you say citizens' assembly in Switzerland, but you mean something very different by it in a sense, right? You mean these yeah, assemblies yeah. where every everyone can go to. Um, so yes, like they they take this idea of sortition, which was used in ancient Greek democracy, but it was used in a completely different way. Um, the Greeks had. Pretty much what you do in a municipality in Switzerland. They had these meetings where, you know, you just show up and you can make amendments and you can discuss them and you vote on them, right? Like that was about, that was their assembly as well. And then, however, they they wanted to prevent corruption, which is a really big issue. And so they chose their officials via sortition. However, the important thing to remember, and this is, I think, what they never bothered to look up, is that officials back in ancient Greece, 2,500 years ago, were very different than officials today. They really didn't have any power. It was like you told them, the assembly told them what to do. You know, they maybe were in charge of keeping the streets clean or like making sure the measures in the marketplace were correct. When they had a rather important job, like being a general in the army, which was probably the most important job in Athens, they elected that person because they had to have someone who is quite competent at what they were doing, right? So you can use sortition in the sense to get a lot of people involved. If you have a lot of people who are randomly involved in things, it becomes very hard to bribe people because it's so hard to keep track of them and there's too many people, right? It gets, starts to get very risky. So you can kind of uh, batten it on to democracy in a way, and it could have its potential uses in like a non-representative democracy for that reason. But this is totally different when they're doing. They actually want it to be small people. If you go to some advocates of citizens assemblies and say, we could do this, but just with like a lot more people, I mean, a lot more people, uh, we could do it over the internet. They don't want that. Like they want it to be small numbers of people because they think that's the only way they can have this kind of carefully controlled discussion, you know, where everything is deliberate. I mean, this is like really different than what was happening in Athens. <laughs> and also, I guess the, during these citizen assembly meetings, they, there are a lot of experts who kind of lay out the arguments and stuff. So they must have also huge, huge influence. In your view, what would be the most significant changes in our current democratic institutions if you think about um, combining elements of representative and direct democracy? I'm probably more for more a direct Democrat than a representative Democrat myself, ultimately. But there are two things you could do if you wanted to do that. The first is to have a system where you would instruct your representative how to vote, right? So you could see a situation where you could say, well, I'll ask my constituents before I cast my vote. The downside to that is it can be quite inflexible, right? You need to negotiate with other members sometimes, and it's very hard to go back and forth and get those instructions all the time. But it's possible. Um, Another thing you could do is have more referendums, obviously, where you have the ultimate control. You have representatives making most of the day-to-day decisions, most of the detailed decisions, but as a, a group of people in the country, the people of the country direct the general policy, right? We Generally, we're going to do this, okay, you representatives figure out the details of exactly how we get there, but you can't contravene these kind of general principles and general decisions that we're getting. So yeah, you can do both of those things, and I think both of them, the first would probably work, the second, I mean, would probably work better than the first, but you can see ways to do both of those things if you wanted to quit easily. Like you could do both of those things would be completely easy to implement. You could also do participatory budgeting where people decide on the budget, which is, I mean, the most important part. Like that's like 95% of politics is deciding on the budget. So that's another thing that people could do is make those budgetary decisions as well. I'm more for making decisions on a high level. Yeah. So in your book, you also write about new technologies and and possibilities of of digital solutions. Um, I see in Switzerland, the only concern is trust. (laughs) You know, do people trust in digital democratic decisions? Obviously, because we we hear so many stories of, you know, um, systems being hacked, et cetera, et cetera. I truly believe, you know, 
digital technologies could be uh, a game changer in some way in in uh, in in democracy but important is it to have a, a, a really serious implementation where people trust the systems and um we had like um systems developed for example in the city of geneva that which were um again uh, discarded because people kind of didn't seem that it improved the the whole decision making process a lot also they didn't probably trust the system enough so what 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 are your concerns and what are your hopes in terms of digital technologies yeah i think when sometimes people say oh digital democracy they think you're like a tech utopian or something i'm like definitely not a tech utopian if anything i think uh technology can be a real threat to democracy because of course it's opened up these possibilities of surveillance um and possibilities of intense centralization so i think those those are actually quite big problems we have to deal with. And I think that's why we need to kind of more get control of technology, right? And use it for purposes we decide rather than purposes that come from above. Um, as far as trusting, ideally for me, you should try to eliminate trust from your system to the greatest extent possible. You know, when you vote directly, like let's just say when the Athenians voted, they counted hands. I know you do that in the municipal uh, assemblies as well. You don't have to trust anything. You can trust your own eyeballs, right? So you're there. Um, ideally, this is what a system should be. So when it comes to, I know a lot of technology that does do um, elections. Um, I think that just doing that electoral bit is a risk. I mean, you're right. Why would you trust that any more than any other kind of election where you can also cheat right you can also ballot box stuff and things like that also in other elections but i agree like that probably that wouldn't be my ideal either i think they're great because that's one piece of it if you want to have people participating more often more deeply all of the time obviously it's cheaper and efficient to do that online doesn't mean you have to do it that way but it is cheaper and more efficient right so so it, it is very handy for that but i think to just do the elections without the decisions, the dialogue coming from people, without being able to reverse decisions, you know, without being able to see transparently how people are discussing. I do see that that's an issue for people to trust it. Weirdly, I think I probably trust it less than most people. I don't know why. Like, I, I, I understand how it works. Like, blockchain can be something that's very useful here. But for myself, I don't know. I'm always the person who thinks there's the unknown unknown. There's always a thing you don't know about and you don't know you don't know about it. So if anything, I'm more paranoid on that. So it's not just a system of just replace what we do and do it online. It's a system of making everything more transparent and more accountable and people being involved more transparently in that in a way that kind of eliminates the need for trust. So I, I actually see it in the in the way we collect signatures in Switzerland, right? Because that process is already kind of part of the of the dialogue because the people who who collect the signatures on the street, so that is all on paper so far, and there is kind of there are new systems developed now that that make the process possible online, which I fundamentally uh, support, but we have to make sure that people really trust it and also we might have to adjust, um, you know, the number of signatures uh, that are collected to um, that are sufficient to make an initiative come to the to to the ballot box. Because obviously, as you say, digital solutions makes many things much cheaper. And um, also, as I say, the, the the process of collection is already part of the of convincing people of a certain issue, even though that's overall uh, quite a uh, quite a small part but uh, fundamentally I'm, I'm i'm in favor of new solutions if they are kind of safe and trustworthy and everything and because eventually i think they will they will appear they will come it's 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 more a matter of time and how well uh, how well we can solve the issues around trust yeah that's a good point because the point of collecting signatures is to make sure that there's enough interest in society that having this referendum is worthwhile, right? Um, and uh, that's, it's a, it's a very good point. There are some software that does kind of imitate that to some extent as well, you know, and it can kind of iteratively see like, is there interest in this? And if there is, it kind of bumps up to the next level. And if there's interest in that, it bumps up to the next level. And th there have been some very uh, good petition software as well in Eastern European nations that has been really integrated with the parliament and has kind of helped to drive that. But you're right. I mean, you don't want to be 
bogged down by every little detail. I mean, nobody wants that. Everybody wants the least work possible in life. So you have to make the system that kind of flags things that are of interest to people and that do have support and eliminates the ones that just kind of fizzle or maybe you deal with them at some later point as well. Mm. And so far, actually, there are already uh, solutions in place in Switzerland where uh, signatures are collected uh, uh, digitally, just to, to make that clear. Um, so, cool. Thanks a lot for, for all your thoughts. That has been a, a very interesting uh, conversation, I think. So what books or articles would you recommend uh, on, on the topic uh, of direct democracy or kind of, you know, the topics you are discussing also in your book? Uh, yeah, obviously, okay. I, I will. Have a lot of good ones. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I will link to to your uh, website, obviously, and and to your book um, in defense of democracy. Uh, but maybe you have some other suggestions. Yeah. Okay. So a really good one is "Ruling the Void" by Peter Mayer, which really goes into how, like, especially European Union institutions, but also central banks, have kind of eroded a lot of decision-making in democracy. So before the 1990s, a lot more things were under control of parliaments than there are today. I come from an international law background. Much as I like international law, it's unfortunately played a role in removing a lot of topics from parliamentary and from democratic agenda. So this is a really good book about that. Um, another one, Company of Citizens by Brooke Manville and Josiah Ober. Um, they're historians, and it's a really interesting look at how democracy in Athens ran, kind of uh, in a really simple way. So I think it's a really good book. Um, then there's a couple that I think are very interesting as well. One's called No Such Thing as a Free Gift. And then the other one I th uh, by Lindsay McGowey. And then there's another one called Winner Takes All by Anand Giridharadis, who's an American commentator. And these are both about the role that... Uh, wealth has played in NGOs recently. So it's about like philanthropy as a kind of controlling mechanism of democracy. Um, this is a substantial role that they play in this day and age. Definitely not something to overlook. So yeah, so those are all really good books. Thanks for, for sharing all those uh, suggestions. And especially the last one seems uh, something I should uh, read as well, because I'm I also like philanthropy. I'm, it's kind of fundamentally, I think it's good, but then um, there is also a lot of money involved and where is money involved? <laughs> there are also, you know, interests. So um, I'm, I'm happy to, to go and look for that. Okay, so uh, Roslyn, thanks a lot for being a guest on my podcast. Uh, it has been a great pleasure. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll be able to make maybe another discussion later on in the future. Great, well, thanks very much for having me. Thanks for listening to this episode. If you liked it, please share it with friends or on social media, or leave a review on your preferred podcast platform. It really helps my podcast and my message to be heard. On my website, rulesofthegame.blog, you find a form to give feedback directly back to me, or just send me an email to stefan.kyberts at gmail.com. I would love to hear your comments or suggestions for upcoming episodes. Take care.